today's uh, topic is Inside Feminist Entrepreneurship and Business Practices by PK Munch, and she's going to be having an awesome presentation a little bit later. But first, as usual, we're just going to start with um, the typical sort of things that we do in all of our meetings, and that is our land acknowledgement. In Canada, it's customary for us to start events such as this with the acknowledgement that compared to Indigenous populations, we're newcomers here, whether our families have lived here for months or for a century. This is part of our truth and reconciliation process with our First Nations, the Indigenous peoples of Canada. We ask that you take a moment to reflect on, research, and understand your own local context about the lands where you live, work, and play. In this spirit, we acknowledge for all of us this is sacred land on which each of us are privileged to be. This land, the nearby lakes and seas have supported human beings for thousands of years and is rich in history, knowledge and tradition. We are privileged to be beneficiaries and the stewards of all that has come before on behalf of the centered seven generations to come and beyond. We invite you to consider your relationship to the land and how you benefit from being there while the original caretakers may not. Take a moment to reflect on, research, understand your, and honor and respect the peoples, the indigenous to the lands where you live, work and play. I personally am in Calgary, which is the traditional territories of the Nitsitepe and the people of Treaty 7, uh, Treaty 7 region, including the Tsetsika, the Kani, the Blood Tribe, uh, Kainai, the Tutsina, the Stony Dakota First Nations, and the city of Calgary is also home to the Métis Nations of Alberta Region 3. So take some time to think about where you are. Do you know what watershed you're in? If you want, want to put that in the chat. And uh, let us know where you are. So this picture is actually Calgary and the watershed is um, the Bow River Basin. And we had a giant flood in 2013 that was a one in 70 year event, caused great havoc in downtown Calgary. So we're a community of innovation, practice, research, and our focus is on the design enterprise and what we call fit for the future. We consider the enterprises fit for future if they follow and accomplish a normative purpose, which we call flourishing. For that, we offer a global network of possibilities for your education, research, and employment. So if those are the areas that you're working in or connected to areas that you're working in, we would love to have you be as part of the network. Uh, it's a network that you can enter quickly. People here are very open and collaborative for cooperation. And there's a lot of knowledge and a lot of competencies and skills in this group. And many find it really fun to interact. So hopefully we can sort of showcase that in this meeting as well. So I hope you're in the right place. And we're going to talk a little bit now about our network. So I just did a little bit of research as uh, uh, um, uh, on our LinkedIn, a strong sustainable business model group. And this is a map that shows everywhere, every, almost everybody that's in the, com in the community. There were a few people that didn't have a country listed, um, so I couldn't kind of tap into it, but there's like 40 or 50 of those. But you can sort of see we're pretty global. There's very few places that we um, don't have some people. So we're a tribe of 2,160 people around the world as of today. And the, actually that's up 130 from last month. Pretty amazing. So how do you find us? This is some of the places that you can find us. We have a wiki where all the history of the meetings and members initiatives are kept. Uh, our Google Drive has the past presentations and record recordings. We have the Strong Sustainable Business Model Group, where most of you came from, from this meeting today. We have a Facebook page, a Twitter page, and a YouTube page. And along the edge there, you can see some of the um, hashtags that we use. All right. We'd also like to think that we're contributing to the growing and worldwide movement of flourishing enterprises. The goal is to create impact Excel quickly, to, to create a world where enterprises excel because humans flourish and nature flour and thrives. So all this is based on a transdisciplinary science system and based uh, trans, sorry, transdisciplinary science, system-based sciences, indigenous knowledge and ethical and moral frameworks. We consider ourselves to not only be in sync with the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals, but even going beyond them. Some of the logos that you see here uh, are part of the movement and these logos, you might recognize some of them and some of them you might not, but I'd very much like you to look them up and they're all unique and very interesting and valuable contributing organizations. Um, Anthony will be able to check with me after the meeting if this slide is up to date. I think it's fairly up to date. With COVID, uh, we've sort of maybe have gotten behind on some of the updates. 
This screen shows some of the initiatives that members of our group have formed, and these are the ones that you can find on the wiki. Um, so these are businesses that are trying to um, do good to do well. So what this means is that members here can come together and the initiatives at any time based on the desired impact that they're trying to create. And it's really up to you to find a way <clears throat> to um, figure out if there's a way that you would like to add your initiative to the wiki and to this slide. Here are some of the upcoming events. So because we are collaborate, we're a collaboration hub for strong sustainability uh, in the sense that there's scientific publications, book publications, conferences, and um, some of the other things that are happening global, locally and globally where you are and around the world. So hopefully you'll be able to hear quite a bit more about what's coming up next. Um, I'm not sure of some of the dates. I know, is Simon on the call? Because I believe that they are, uh, oh, not, um, sorry, Ralph. Um, I'm not sure if someone has the dates for the R3.0, but anyone it's, who... it's September 7th and 8th. I found that out this week. Perfect, thank you. I've also started a calendar for the Strong Sustainable Business Model Group. So I'll be adding all of the different events to the calendar. Hopefully we can help keep people informed about when things are coming up. Nothing's in it right now except our next, uh, our next event. So the people that try to help keep the group going and interested and active is um, Tim and I. And some of you may have uh, heard from me over the last little while uh, about how you might want to engage in the uh, community. So we'll be connecting with the, with, with the various regions uh, to see how we might create some pockets of people working together, connecting together locally, but then how they can fit into the, the um, ecosystem. So if you have any questions about the group, if you want to get involved, if you want to volunteer, if you want to speak, um, we're always happy, willing, and able to connect with you. And we're happy to connect you with other members. If you don't know somebody, but you've found somebody that you'd like to connect with, um, just let us know. Our next meeting is April 13th, and that is going to be Simon Robbins and Igor Kuto. And they're going to be talking about the Flourishing Business Model Canvas and next generation online collaboration platforms. I don't have all the details about it yet, um, but that will be coming out shortly. So today our speaker is uh, Petra Kassan Much. PK Much is an award-winning ser serial entrepreneur with Purpose Driven. She's a publisher who's deeply committed to creating a more inclusive, just human-centered and generative economy through the power of feminist business practices, pedagogy, theory, innovation, and entrepreneurship. Her enterprise, Evolution Inc., is a B Corp certified lean networked feminist enterprise advocating for and designing programs that promote equity and inclusion in startup and community based economic development ecosystem. Her magazine, Lisbeth, serves as a convener, capacity builder, and voice for the growing 10,000 plus all gender entrepreneurial feminist community. The three things that we hope you get from this session is engaging with values, concepts, and practices that distinguish feminist enterprises from others learn about the feminist economy and the growing com community of entrepreneurial feminists, leave with actionable business insights to deploy in your own work, and leave feeling more hopeful in advancing gender uh, equity in our lifetime. Take it away, PK. So thank you so much for spending your uh, time with us or me this afternoon. It's a beautiful day outside in Tacaranto, and I know most people might rather be outside, but I promise you, that uh, there'll be at least one good takeaway from today's uh, session, I hope. Um, someone in the chat, before I get started, someone in the chat asked about the Feminist Party of Canada. And we aren't going to talk about the Feminist Party of Canada, but for those of you who are curious, I'm going to put a, a link in the chat because yes, uh, in fact, uh, as many of you might know, lots of countries in Europe have feminist parties and women, uh, women only political parties. But Canada had one too in 1979, 500 people signed up uh, to start it, including men, and it didn't last very long, but we did have it and there were buttons to prove it. Um, today we're going to talk about feminist enterprise practice and I'm just going to share my screen if uh, you will for a moment here. And uh, I am going to be looking sideways because I have two screens so I'm going to try to go back and forth and, and look at all of you. Uh, or actually, I might be able to know the camera won't let me do that. 
but um, I'm going to uh, show the slides and, uh, and go from there. In this time, we're going to talk about what is uh, feminism, uh, definitions of feminism, what's your definition of feminism, feminist business practice, how people define it, and also what does feminist business practice look like, because I see myself as a practitioner, not an academic. I try to take these ideas and actually put them into practice in my own business. And uh, just speaking on my own business, um, Highwire is actually the new brand of Evolution. And uh, it's, a, it's still kind of the same business, but I have two businesses. Uh, this one, which is the consulting business, uh, which is actually the bulk of the work that we do. And we've worked uh, on a number of research projects. I know we work with Andine on the Wozen project. I've worked with Anthony. Um, we've worked in a number of different spaces. The other business I run, which most of you may have heard about, or maybe not, uh, is called Lisbeth.com. It is a feminist enterprise magazine that reports on the women's enterprise space via a feminist lens. So we profile the work of entrepreneurs trying to do things differently and, in fact, enact feminist business practices to show others how they're doing it. Um, we also profile often underrepresented and marginalized uh, entrepreneurs, uh, female entrepreneurs. And um, we have an open access magazine, Lisbeth.com, uh, a monthly newsletter which has exclusive information in it that is not in the open access uh, magazine. And we have an online community, uh, uh, online membership community called the Feminist Enterprise Commons, where we basically struggle as a community trying to learn about how to do this stuff better. And Anthony is a regular member and we really value his participation and his uh, really interesting contributions to the conversations. And finally, we're launching a new nonprofit this year called Lisbeth MX. So that's a little bit about the businesses I run. Um, I'm gonna skip over my land acknowledgement uh, that I was gonna do, but uh, I do wanna start also with a knowledge acknowledgement. And oftentimes, uh, as practitioners, we draw on the insights and uh, work of so many others, including our contemporaries and colleagues. And it's important to take the time to mention uh, where some of that work came from. This list is inadequate in the sense that it is in no way comprehensive. If it was comprehensive, I would have listed my mother on here too. Uh, but we don't go back that far. Uh, but these are some of the key folks that have influenced uh, some of this work in the more recent past. And I, we do have, a, I do publish a reading list, Elizabeth reading list at this link, which has over 50, what I consider to be really important titles. I know that's a lot, but 50 really important titles that are seminal to our thinking in terms of feminist entrepreneurship and feminist space work. Also, there is 20, there is another list of 25 anti-racism uh, books and uh, that are written by Canadian Black women authors only. So it's a there's lots of anti-racism book lists out there, but this one is unique in that it's all Canadian and it is by women. So I invite you to take a look at that. Why this workshop? I have a thesis and that is learning about feminism and feminist uh, practices can help us understand how to build better businesses. It's really as simple as that. Uh, feminist business practices also requires learning about feminism and you can't learn about feminism on your own. You have to do it in community with others because it takes a lot of work to really understand where people are coming from. And finally, um, I mentioned that uh, I have a practitioner's perspective. Why I care about this? Um, I don't think we can change society with diversity and inclusion alone. Diversity inclusion initiatives are great, but they tend to, they tend to focus on me, um, things you can measure. How many people of what kind are on the board? How many people of what kind do we have in our company? Those kinds of things, that's great, but it's, it's, it doesn't end there as we know. And also we realize how fragile DNI and i um, types of initiatives are in especially corporations um, because we have already seen that we slip. And Fortune 500 has, uh, and you know, kind of come out with numbers last year that showed a decline in the number of women at the top. And uh, I, I, you know, there's a number of similar examples. So in other words, this freedom that we're trying to win is always, always uh, has to be worked on. Uh, it does not seem to stick. And one of the ideas of feminist business practice is creating practices that will allow those changes to stick. 
and not roll over the next time a new politician comes in or the next time there's a financial collapse and everybody's priorities change. Um, today's agenda, I mentioned briefly, and we are gonna do some, some work together. And I did also wanna just quickly talk about the space that we are, that I'm hoping we can create here today while we're having this conversation. Um, it is being recorded, so I won't expect everybody, you know, be as vulnerable and open as you feel comfortable doing so. Um, we are obviously, I'm not going to read this to you, but the core tenants are mutual respect, assume everybody's coming from a good place, uh, have the agency to just say I disagree or I'm uncomfortable. And um, yes, by all means, share the slideshow and uh, stretch your style a bit. If you're usually kind of like this on Zoom, consider moving or raise your hand or, or doing something uh, that is a little more emotive. Okay, so uh, anything anyone wants to add to just the, you know, the kind of, uh, the kind of space we're trying to create here? We're all good? I did remember, I did forget one thing and that is uh, breaks. We're not gonna take a break. I hope that's okay, Lori. I don't know if you normally do that, but since it's a short time, uh, please make sure you take care of yourself during the presentation. Leave if, if you have to, be right back if you have to, uh, that kind of thing. Okay, so the first thing we're going to do is, um, I, I haven't had a chance to get to, to see who's all here. So what I would like to do is invite you to, I've seen your names in the check-in, but uh, maybe we could go around the table, so to speak, around the square. And uh, I'm going to ask you what your relationship with feminism is as it stands today. What is your relationship with feminism? So let's start with uh, Andrew. Uh, putting me on the spot. <laughs> <laughs> um, excellent question. Um, something I'm trying to think more about as the father of a daughter who's about to start university and at the beginning of her career and all the challenges of life that she'll encounter and definitely thinking about, you know, the hope that she will not have some of the same struggles, but likely will and how she will overcome them and what kind of support that she will find and what kind of communities she'll build and, you know, what kind of changes her and her generation will make. Um, I got to say, watching her and her friends interact gives me uh, a lot of hope. So um, I just, they kind of, they just impressed me and they're so organized, but they just seem to have such a, a fun time whenever they're doing their thing, whether it's on Zoom or, or wherever, you know, it's been a, a tough year to be a teenager um, for the last, I mean, for all of us, but especially for teenagers. So, um, but I, I've just really been impressed how they've persevered and kind of built their connections, you know, using the tools at their disposal. So I don't know if I answered your question, but. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's, no, that's great. So let's start there. Simon, what's your relationship with feminism? Um, I've got quite an interesting family background in that a great aunt of mine was Harriet Weaver. I've got this book about her, and she, I don't know if you know Harriet Weaver. She was generally considered one of the first British feminists. So she was born 1876, died in 1961. And um, we have um, a, a portrait of her, or, you know, my parents have a portrait. She did an awful lot. Um, you know, our family was, you know, a very, well-to-do family and she invested a lot of the family resources starting feminist based publications mm -hmm. and she also um, helped James Joyce when James Joyce was very young to help get his works published so in our family we have this history and also more immediately my immediate aunt is Liz Watson um, Liz Watson in the 1970s joined Rolls-Royce and two years ago, she won a Women in Science Engineering Lifetime Achievement Award mm -hmm. for being the first female chief engineering officer, i.e. the most senior engineer in Rolls-Royce. And then coming forward, 
um, recently I've become the co-founder of a deep tech ecosystem here in Brazil. So I have a lot of re responsibility. Our deep tech ecosystem, we're actually quite proud. We have a very high percentage of um, LBGT representatives. And I've become very aware of my role is, you know, I've moved more from say a consultancy role into a leadership role. So I, I'm very interested in this talk, learning more about how to really be conscious about how to help the female entrepreneurs in our ecosystem. They have a very diverse background. Some are inspirational working in very challenging and dangerous areas in Brazil. And, you know, I'm looking here, for, you know, I feel that I'm very conscious and I have values, but I'm always looking for how can I improve my leadership practices to become more aware and looking at new models of leadership. So I'm hoping to learn a bit today. Although I've got this, you know, our family has a background in with um, feminisms going quite far back. Wow, well, well, I'm gonna give a, a, you know, hooray to the legacy that so many of your uh, women identified family members have left uh, and put us all in a better space. So thank you for sharing that. And if you wanna put the book in the chat, go uh, please do so we can learn more about it or at least check her out on Wikipedia. Yeah, um, and so I did thank a- Thank you for that. I did an interview with my aunt as well when she won her award. So I'll put a link to that as well. That would be great. Thank you. All right, Doug, I see you uh, sometimes in the morning in meditation. What's your relationship to feminism? And, oh, I just I turned on the video but forgot to unmute. Um, yeah, I don't, um, I don't think about it um, a whole lot, I guess. But I, I, I I drift towards um, and have always drifted towards, uh, it's what has, I think, um, put me at odds with uh, institutional kind of um, uh, environments where I just felt there was a, a steamrollery kind of um, um, dynamic going on and uh, and often, yeah, just not really geared towards uh, being the, the inclusiveness and uh, and addressing the well-being of the community and fostering um, uh, the potential of all. And uh, I guess that's what I associate with it. And it's what has attracted me into um, the SSBMG and um, along the way, um, this kind of openness that is uh, continues to be, I think, striving and humble, um, but um, yeah, always trying to be supportive at the same time. Oh, great. Thank you, Doug. Amy, are you in a position to uh, tell us about your your relationship with feminism? Yes. Hello. Uh, can you hear me? Yeah. Okay. I can't see. Um, so uh, this is my first time here. I'm glad to, to, to be here. Um, Anthony extended the invite. Um, <laughs> I, I think I would say that um, I'm a student of uh, feminism and a, a practitioner like yourself. Um, and I like to use my voice to advance um, the ideals. I have some specific experience with regards to, I, I think what you said about practicing in community resonated with me because um, I had an opportunity, I'm American and we, we've recently moved um, back to Canada. We've, we've been mm -hmm. here uh, twice now, once in Can uh, Toronto and uh, we're now here in Oakville. Oh. And um, when I was in the States uh, recently, I joined a volunteer organization, Moms Demand Action for Gun Sense in America. And mm. I was thinking about your slide around women who inspired your work. Um, Shannon Watts was a stay-at-home mother. And after the Sandy Hook shooting, she kind of decided she needed to do something about it. And that organization has been, um, it's, uh, it's not just moms, um, but it was kind of... Um, uh, conceived and um, highly powered by by women and mothers um, concerned for their children's safety and so the um, the work there was very rewarding um, and a huge community of activist females um, and then also from that I met some sisters I would say and we um, co-founded a political action committee to help advance progressive um, candidates um, people of color 
women into um, federal and state offices uh, in Colorado at the time and also um, at the, uh, at the uh, federal level in Washington, DC. So um, I think also on a personal level, feminism for me is about how can we better, it's not even about the equality of the sexes, it's about there are key differences. Maternity, for instance, is a, is a real issue that I've struggled with over time um, in terms of organizations not making space and really recognizing the value of of um, mothers in society and allowing them more flexible working arrangements. Um, Canada certainly is a lot further along than in the US, um, but we have so much more to go to really recognize and value the contributions that um, women make in our, our world and society. Great, all right, great. Great to have you here, Amy. And Thank welcome you. back to Canada. Thank Good you, I'm decision. very glad to be here. Stand. Yes. <laughs> Good decision. Um, Josh, how about you? What's your relationship with feminism? Thanks. Um, my um, mother uh, studied um, feminist theology. And so Ooh. that was, <laughs> I was around that. And, um, and I remember um, that, uh, that, my parents split up and she moved downtown and we would go to church and she was checking out different churches. And then uh, she settled on one and was like, why do we have to go to this one? It's like a 20 minute walk from her place. Um, you know, it, every week, all year. Um, and it was the kind of place that um an Anglican church where they really were working on inclusive language. And, and so um, that's where I've seen her kind of uh, flourish um, in, in that regard. Yeah, so that's, that's my most salient, I think, uh, relationship to feminism. Okay, thank you, Josh. Josh, uh, Andine, I know you said you were preparing dinner for the kids, but do you have time to chime in on your relationship with feminism? Yeah, sure. Sorry, I'm just going to be a little in and out because it's that time of day. Um, yeah, so my relationship is interesting, um, I guess, because I, I definitely grew up very much in the patriarchy and uh especially as an entrepreneur um believed for many well i mean uh, just conditioned it just is the way it is that you as a woman you exist in business as a man would exist in business and you conform and you shape yourself in that way um and it's very unconscious and so unpacking feminism for me um, has actually been a very deep journey personally um, and I've been very privileged to have met some incredible role models such as yourself Petra um, over the last couple of years and I didn't even realize I mean I've always believed I was a feminist I've always had a very strong voice and I was pretty mortified to realize how much of my intrinsic value as a woman in business I have shut down over the years. Mm. And so I'm on that journey personally um, in reclaiming my um, feminine value in the work that I do. And of course, I have the great privilege of being able to explore this in designing and developing women's entrepreneurship brace programming. Um, and so doing, getting to do some really deep work, unpacking um, how we reimagine women's role in business, not reimagine it, but how we, um, how we enable women to find their place, their intrinsic place in, uh, in business. And so very exciting, um, working on a, a very interesting project called Wozen which Petra has been part of uh, for the last couple of years, uh, doing this deep work. So yeah, it's a personal and, um, you know, a journey of taking and supporting other women to do the same. 
Okay, okay, thank you. I'm glad you had had time to chime in for that. Andine, it's great to see you. Anthony, your relationship with feminism, sir. Uh, so I, I, like some of you, I grew up in a, a household where um, it was almost taken for granted that the, there was an equality of the sexes and um, the strength that came from that um, was sort of obvious as I was growing up and the idea that diversity is strength um, was a powerful part of my growing up and so that's true in every human field including human organizations and when I learned because of some colleagues of ours, uh, uh, C.V. Harkwell, that um, feminism has also chosen the term flourishing to describe its ultimate goal. It just kind of reinforced um, all of these beliefs and ideas that I'd had for many, many years, um, that uh, things are just going to be better uh, because they're going to be moving towards flourishing when we, when we have the feminist set of ideas and practices uh, widely applied in society. It's just going to be better. Okay. And Laurie, we have to hear from you as well. Thanks. Um, well, I think I've, I've had a bit of a love-hate relationship with the, just the term feminism because uh, I come from a background where I didn't really have any strong female or male role models. My father worked out of the house and my mother uh, relegated all housework and chores to me. Um, so I was like the woman of the household and uh, as uh, through the years, you know, there's times when I thought feminine, feminism was a bad thing and as I mature, as my maturity ebbs and flows, I, I still wrestle with the idea. Um, I don't come at, at feminism from an equity or equality space, I come at it from a social justice space and so I think uh, just hearing this conversation so far and everybody else's uh, input has actually helped me think a little bit more deeply about it because I don't actually think about it very much. Most of my men are friends. I'm always trying to get myself into, you know, the group, which is typically men. And, um, you know, I don't have any women's circles that I even participate in. So even this conversation is a bit of a revelation for me. Okay, great. All right. Well, thank you, everybody, for sharing your relationship with feminism. And I hope in that doing that exercise, I brought up to your consciousness that we actually do have a relationship with feminism, even if you haven't talked about it, read about it, or thought about it in quite some time. My own relationship with feminism runs fairly deep. Uh, lots of history, which I won't get into right now, but um, I, I declared myself an ardent feminist at the age of 13. It was 1975, I wore the why not buttons. And if anybody remembers that in 1975 was the year that the UN declared the first time ever year of the woman. Um, I went on to, uh, to university and uh, I did not study women's uh, studies, but I marched and I was uh, kind of always involved in feminism in some way, shape or form. Uh, then I hit what I call my patra patriarchal phase, which lasted about 20 years. And in that patriarchal phase, I actually transformed from a pre previously bohemian kind of 25 year old into Margaret Thatcher. I wore pearls. I had the hair, I, had, I don't know if some of the women here remember the ties that everybody wore, like, a, you know, we all had the little ties, big shoulders to make ourselves look really big. And I spent 20 years in corporate life figuring out how to do business like, uh, like the patriarchy would suggest. And I use the word patriarchy instead of men because women can be patriarchs too. It's a belief system, it's a thought a, a, around how things should work, what gets valued, what doesn't get valued, that's deeply informed by the patriarchal system that was ultimately created by men, a few men, for the benefit of all men. Um, so I have other histories. Uh, certainly, I'll just share a few of them. Uh, my mother's best friend was bludgeoned to death by her boyfriend because she rebuked him with a tire iron. Uh, so I have seen that kind of one in four women are domestically uh, assaulted in Canada. We're, we're not a third world country. And so when you're close to something like that and then see how the law handles it, you also get a taste of how the patriarchy works and how the system works to um, suppress uh, a particular gender. 
and uh, there are many other examples. So I usually like to say our relationship with feminism is forged over time. You aren't born a feminist, you experience things in your life and you notice that, oh, my gender actually means that I have a different lived experience than someone who has a different gender than I do. And it's not all uh, a function of biology, but biology certainly plays a role, a role in that. I want to go into definitions of feminism and the feminist movement. So some of you, this may seem obvious too, but I usually like to call it out. The feminism is one of the world's uh, four great social movements. There are others, there's climate crisis movements and things like that, more current ones, but I'm talking about social movements and um, they have all have something in common. And that is that they are also, they're not just about a fight for equality looking at it from different angles. They're all frameworks of analysis and they're deep. So one of the things we have to think about with feminism, it's not just about women actually, or women's equality. It runs much deeper than that. It looks uh, heavily at power, power relationships. And I'm gonna talk a little bit more about that and more uh, other aspects to the framework that feminism uh, is about. So I'm going to, I know many of you do work in many spaces. So I'm going to suggest to you that feminism as a framework for analysis is the starting point for understanding where your practices need to change. Because by donning that lens, you will notice things that you didn't notice before. So feminism is all about gender in terms of power categories. Uh, obviously, the civil rights movement is all about race. Uh, you know, Marxism uh, and class is all about rich over poor and worker and capitalist. And of course, in the, uh, in the uh, green space, it's about man over nature and the green and ecology movement. So these are, this is just a way to frame feminism as not just about individual women's empowerment. And it is a social movement of great consequence, probably the world's largest social movement in terms of membership, if you count 51% of the globe. And uh, it is a framework for analysis. Um, some of the central conversations in feminism, and you might recognize some of them here, and I heard some things come up in the discussion that we had or the introductions, which made me think about uh, think about things. So for example, I noticed some of you put he, she, or she, she her, in or they, them, in your, in your name. One of the feminist practices is to include pronouns in your names. Uh, why do we do that? Because we want to demonstrate and, sh and make space for people of other gen that don't identify in a binary way. And one of the ways we do that is by saying, hey, this is my gender, Identif uh, this is my gender, um, not my biology, this is how I identify as a gender. And it makes space for people who might not identify as he, 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 him, or she, her, to come forward and also demonstrate, show the world that there are other genders other than two. Um, so that's one of the reasons we do that as a practice. Um, and uh, okay, so I'm gonna, uh, the other thing I noticed is, um, is uh, okay, I'm gonna skip over that for a second. So the kinds of things we talk about in this feminist space, power, it's all about power. Who has it, who doesn't, and what are the implications? It's about ending oppression that stems from a power imbalance. It's about obviously equity, equality, which is also stemming from power. You'll see power is sort of the central, central theme here. Um, in gender inclusion, critical race theory, anti-black racism, classism, ableism, all the different forms of oppression. Some of you may be aware of the, the matrix of oppressions. And if you're not, I invite you to look that up in Google so you can see the not only the types of oppressions that exist in the world, but the intersection of those uh, oppressions, which is the point Kimberly, Craw Kimberly Crawford made when she talked about intersectional feminism, meaning that women are not just women, men are not just men. We actually experience the world on a number of different planes. If you are uh, differently abled, neurodiverse, um, racialized, you're, you have multiple things, social beliefs and biases to deal with as you live your life. Um, so these are a list of things, I won't read them all out. Uh, one of the other things that is increasingly important in feminism and indeed probably always has been is your standpoint. It is not enough to say you're a feminist in most spaces these days. In fact, if you go on Facebook and join feminist uh, organizations, you must read 
there about us. Why? Because there are many trans exclusive, fem really great feminist organizations who are trans exclusive. And in Canada, that's a problem because we have a human rights code that says that that's not okay. And that's not true in the States. So you'll see the, what's called the turf conversation come up differently, but we have a very large turf feminist um, sector here in Canada. And I'll talk about that uh, in a moment, a little bit more. So it, feminism is not just one thing. And in fact, there's many types of feminisms. And I have these charts here. They're not perfect charts. There's problems with both of them. I dis you know, many feminists uh, disagree with some of the ways this is cast, and I'm going to show you two of them. But they do make the point that feminism is not one thing, just like religion is not one thing. And you kind of can't just identify, um, depending on the space that you're in, you're going to have to identify as what kind of feminism, what kind of feminist you are. So uh, in the ter ter terms of, um, so it's a pluralistic movement. What kind of feminism are you? There are radical feminists. Are you a radical feminist? What is a radical feminist? Um, you might be surprised when we, um, when we go down the list. In this, in this particular, which is from definition of types of feminism from the UK, they define radical feminism as, uh, as patriarchy, as the purposeful oppression of women, and they focus on societies of, and institutions as the root cause of inequality. You'll see over here in liberal, you'll hear the term liberal feminist. What does that mean? Uh, liberal feminism is a little bit different. And it, also neoliberal feminism is even more different. Neoliberal neo feminism argues that women can do anything men can do and they should be allowed to do that. But uh, it tends to uh, also essentialize women and you get conversations around women are more collaborative. Women are nurturing. Women have these special skills as, as, uh, to bring to the party. But how do you as fathers or mothers of boys receive that? Because we know that men can be as collaborative, as nurturing and as, 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 as women can. The only difference might be in when people do studies is it's been socialized out of them or socialized in the way that that gets uh, males to devalue those skills uh, that they might have uh, that they might have so too much to talk about in one 90 minute session the point I want to make is that um, that feminism is diverse pluralistic and it moves as a movement it is not static I would argue in some ways, Marxism is a bit static sometimes, but feminism has moved with the times. And so you will see the, for example, people talk about four waves of feminism. And, you know, the first one was, was, uh, was um, rights-based and then it was, um, uh, you know, law-based and right, well, that's still the rights-based second wave feminism. Third wave was all about gender and now, and, and understanding there's more than one gender. And now we're talking a lot about intersectional feminism, which is the recognition that you can't just address gender and solve for oppression and inequality. You have to address all forms of oppression if you want everyone to have an equal chance to flourish. Uh, here's another map just to drive you crazy. Um, and this is another uh, institution's uh, map of different types of feminism. And uh, there's political uh, lesbianism, radical cultural feminists who believe in, uh, there's some, rad it's under the heading of radical, but it's a capital R radical, which are women who believe that, that uh, the world would be just much better without, with only, you know, if women just dominated. And that's not a common theme throughout all of feminism. That is one faction. It's, it's a bit like suggesting that um, you know, all Christians are white supremacists, for example. So it's, if, the, so there's, you know, we have to be careful how the media portrays some of this stuff. Um, the thing to think about here is again, how diverse it is. And, and it's one of the movement's strengths. It keeps it alive. Um, okay, so if there's a lot of different feminisms out there, which one are you? And how would someone, if you're in a party of feminists and you're arriving at a bar, uh, in a feminist bar, uh, who do you want to hang out with? Um, and, and, you know, you, you can't just assume that you're all on the same page. And I'll use the turf as a uh, turf uh, space as an example. Megan Murphy is out of BC. Some of you may know about her. 
and if, uh, she caused a, a lot of dust up she continues to do because she has a very anti-trans feminist perspective, uh, which is actually against human rights code in Canada. Um, and the reason is though, is her personal experience around women's shelters and trans men in trans uh, women in women's shelters. Like there's a whole conversation about whether or not a trans male should be, even if they identify as a trans woman, should be in a woman's shelter because women in shelters have been traumatized by men and therefore it further traumatizes the females in those shelters. So these are the complex conversations people have. And it's important to say whether you're trans inclusive or not. And uh, that's often something in the description uh, that you'll find right up on feminist organizations. Um, okay, so I have a definition here of our uh, our feminism. So I, I put this up on Lisbeth and also on Highwire to make it clear what kind of feminists we are. And uh, I'm not going to read it all to you, but I'm going to invite you to consider this definition later to say what would you say about what kind of feminist, you know, practice or beliefs uh, do you align most with? And I'm not going to say that any of these other types of feminisms are wrong. Feminism is all about advancing gender equality, uh, and it looks at, uh, you know, eradicating all oppression so that everyone can flourish. It tends to center gender as part of the conversation, but it, um, but where everybody difference, different, differs is how to get there. That is like the number one difference between different types of feminism, and people argue about how we can achieve equality and a state of of uh, an oppressionless society where everyone can flourish. It's the how, not the what. Um, okay, so I'm gonna pause there and I'm gonna give you a bit of space uh, to think about uh, your, and maybe Laura, you can time it for me. I'm going to put on a bit of soothing music and um, I want you to think for three minutes about what your what your definition of feminism is. Just while we have this space together here, I'm not gonna ask you to share it so you can privately put down those points. And maybe what I'll do is I'll share uh, the high wire one here, if you can see that, just so you can have something to reflect on or bounce against. And um, yeah, so let me see if I can pull up my music thing here and maybe we'll give the bell three minutes. And uh, for some reason, my Spotify is not coming up here. I might be out of bandwidth, so you might just have to do this quietly. Okay, welcome back everybody. I hope that moment of reflection uh, was helpful. And I wanted to start this next part with uh, showing you this website. So again, along the theme of what kind of feminist are you? Uh, this is an organization in Canada with many thousands of members, and it's called the Real Women of Canada. Has anyone heard of this organization before? Okay, so uh, you probably have one of these in Brazil, in the UK. Every country has this type of organization. This is kind of like the Phyllis Shapely world, for those of you who uh, in the US from back in the second wave world. But Real Women of Canada is a feminist organization. They are anti-pro-choice. They are pro-family and believe women should be in the home because that's where women really shine and because society needs people, good caregivers at home to raise better kids who are less inclined to be invited to drugs and crime and all that sort of thing. Is this what you'd expect of a feminist organization as a set of values? Probably depending on where you are. So this is where I make the point that it looks really friendly and it looks really diverse and uh, really wonderful, but that's what this organization is about. So one of the other things you have to decide for yourself is are you a pro-choice, pro-reproductive rights feminist, or are you a pro-life feminist? Which is, you know, weird words to use, but that's what they use. What's your stance on abortion rights? So I think I've made the point that it's complex and uh, you, it's really important to, when you engage in the conversation, to kind of have a sense of where that is. Okay, so now I'm going to move into what is, oops, uh, right, here we go. So we've done that, we've done this. 
on my space. Now let's talk about feminist entrepreneurship. So generally speaking, some feminists don't believe capitalism and feminism go together and that entrepreneurs are just little capitalists waiting to get bigger. Uh, little little uh, bourgeoisie uh, folks, uh, you know, ready to become capitalists. But that is not true in the history of women and their relationship to work. Uh, in fact, entrepreneurship is and small businesses are really distinct from what we understand as big C capitalist uh, work uh, and and the you know effects of capitalism today. Um, and so one of the things, we, so feminist entrepreneurship kind of argues that actually uh, doing business capitalism in in a different form is very much feminist in its in its practice when it's done when it's done in a certain way. Uh, there are several thought leaders who think about what feminist enterprise is, and I'll introduce two of them. One is Barbara Orser, and she wrote a book called Feminine Capital, which basically defines feminist enterprises as uh, she has this, uh, the, um, you know, everybody has a four square it's somewhere in their analysis. And uh, so she would define, uh, segregate um, enterprises into high masculine, high feminine traits, and then high social and high financial traits. Neoclassical enterprises by her definition are those that are profit first, profit motivated, wealth creation motivated for shareholders and owners. High feminine businesses in the high financial space are, that are profit generated, high feminine businesses tend to be relational, meaning they prioritize the quality of relationships as they do business. And by the way, notice it's not about men or women. Any, a male run firm can be a highly relational enterprise. But in both of these top tiers, it's about profit and growth and uh, getting there uh, and that kind of thing. Uh, high social businesses, uh, she had put social enterprises in this place, but also put it in the high masculine space. And the reason this is important is let's just think of We Charity uh, and some other social enterprises across Canada uh, that was a social enterprise, but actually very patriarchal in its management lack of transparency, and you can read all about it. I'm sure most of you have. I've met the Kielbergers and uh, good folks on one level, but uh, definitely not a feminist enterprise in practice. In fact, far from it. So you can have a social impact business and still be very patriarchal and very high masculine in your approach and cause damage in the, in the process. Then you have feminist enterprises, high feminine, high social. And in her case, she says, it's about uh, businesses that specifically focus on generating equity and equality for equity seeking groups, not limited, not, you know, I won't, again, I won't read you all these different equity seeking groups. And uh, she would argue that feminist enterprises do one of two things. One is they actually create products and services that specifically work to advance gender justice. Uh, or reduce oppressions. Like for example, in Fifth Wave, one of the accelerators I work with, we have Sisterhood Media, run by four black women who decided they were tired of seeing all white led movies and developed a black movie, a black only uh, streaming movie channel, Netflix with all black content. And so she would be, and she identifies as a feminist and she would be thought of as a feminist enterprise because her entire enterprise is there to work on on, um, on uh, equality. And uh, okay, so that's one definition. Uh, C.V. Harquill, who I know you'll be working with in the future is a, a major thinker in this space as well. And uh, she has a book, which I know she'll tell you about in her coming session, but in case you haven't read it, Feminism, a Key Idea for Business and Society. It's a great feminist 101 primer and also makes a lot of suggestions for how business can benefit by adopting feminist practices. And I know you're going to be hearing from her but uh, soon, but her definition is basically a set of practices that don't oppress your stakeholders, your workers, and all of those. Kind of, how can we do business in a better way inside our businesses? So Barbara is kind of more like, what are you doing with your business? And CV is more like, how are you doing you know, how, the how of your business. Um, okay, I'm gonna do another little exercise here because I like for this to be a little, uh, a little uh, interactive. So I'm going, we've talked about feminism, the definition of it. I'm now going to, 
uh, put in the chat here. Just let me see if I can find it. Uh, where's my Mentimeter thing? What I'd like you to think about is what, here it is, what, what do you imagine feminist business practices to be about now that we have talked about it? So can everybody see this slide here? Yeah? Okay, so we're gonna co-create something that we can all take away with, our, with ourselves, uh, with, <laughs> our, with each other or after today. And I want everybody to, I'm gonna put the link in the chat and this is gonna create a word cloud. Uh, and I want everybody to put in words that you think would, and ideas that you think would be part of a feminist approach to doing business. So we'll give this a minute or two and you should be able to see the words appear, but what kinds of ideas and practices do you think would be part of a feminist business practice suite? Okay, we see the word empathetic. Rights, okay. Okay. Openness, inclusive, supportive, collaborative. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Nourishing, equal pay, participatory, relational. Okay, uh, meeting sideways. <laughs> Uh, child care, yeah, yeah, baby. <laughs> and uh, nurturing, participatory. Okay, I'll just give it another couple of seconds to uh, see if, if you come up with anything else. And then I am going to save this and I will send it to Lori. She can include it, uh, include it in uh, your folder, um, that kind of thing. Okay, and I see a few more coming in. Flex time, listening. Yeah, okay. All right, good. So uh, you can keep typing stuff in if you get moved <laughs> by something. Um, but I'm going to uh, now, so you did pretty well. Congratulations, you definitely identified, you identified a lot of the outcomes you're looking for. But what we also want to talk about is the how, and that is the hard part. So um, I'm going to go into the how. So I want to preface what I'm going to talk about now is that this how is my how based on everything we've learned. I am not the, the arbiter of all forms of feminist business practices, but these are the things that I felt uh, uh, in learning from everyone else were most germane to the business that I, that I run and operate. So what you're going to see here is a flower. Uh, I like to illustrate businesses, business ideas in, in ways that don't involve rigid charts and bars and graphs and things like that. So um, the first thing we started with was, was to ask, what are the values that are most important to us as an enterprise? And for us, it was about ecosystem. We see, uh, we see managing an enterprise as an ecosystem that involves a lot of different stakeholders, including ones that you don't often see. I'll use, for example, the fact that I had a dairy uh, for Fifth Town Artisan Cheese, which some, some of you all know about. Um, and we had a bio wetland out back uh, to digest the whey of the bear of the of the dairy, which was a waste product. And uh, we had three separate ponds and, a, and out the other end came potable water. One day we had to dig up the first pond, the, the first part of it, because it was kind of flooding and we didn't know why. And uh, so a bulldozer came and dug up this big, it was like the size of a swimming pool, and which is kind of like a filtration system, many layers of peat moss, rocks, and all that kind of stuff. And uh, this, this space on the surface looked dead, right? Like uh, well, there were plants growing on it and that was all cool. But basically, you know, I expected when I turned it over to find dirt. But what we found was, as they turned over the dirt, was a thriving, oh my God, live ecosystem of bugs of many kinds, beetles, worms, you name it. I, I didn't even want to see most of these things. 
But I realized that these were also our stakeholders because they were the ones that were actually eating the waste that made it possible for potable water to come out at the other end. So when we think of who's in our ecosystem, uh, we think about a lot of different players and I'll show you a chart on that in a moment. We also think heavily about governance uh, and that has to do with how decisions are made, who makes them. I saw the word participatory and inclusive, but how inclusive and participatory are you? When sometimes we think of participation as within our own organization, but how often do we reach out to our stakeholders to also have them have a say in how we are going to move forward on something? And I'll talk more about that in a moment too. Whole humanness is one of uh, CV's concepts, which is about recognizing that human beings bring their whole selves to work, uh, their bodies, their minds, their uh, child care, elder care responsibilities. I, I feel like that one is sort of one that we've kind of come to realize is the case. We don't just compartmentalize things when we go to work and still remain productive. Generativity is the concept of for everything, it's the concept of one plus one equals five. So for everything you do, um, is it generative? Does it actually help someone else? While you're doing it and making money doing it, are you also creating opportunities for someone else? Are you being generative uh, in the work that you do? And finally, social justice. This next slide is too hard to read, but you're all going to have a copy of it. And what this does is actually articulates what our feminist values look like in action. And I'll just point out a few of them that might actually be a value uh, that maybe surprises or, um, or you know, something new. So under the ecosystem world, um, I, I, and there are quotes here by feminists I love, uh, Adrienne Marie Brown. Um, I feel like this group, the Strongly Sustainable Business Model Group, has this down in spades. You guys are really great at thinking about the broader ecosystem and, and uh, you know, that kind of thing. So I'm not going to focus a lot there. Um, I am going to talk a little bit on governance because I feel that's a completely overlooked area. And even companies of one need to have a code of conduct that they share with their customers on how they go about making decisions and who they include and who they exclude in doing that. Um, we have just finished create, crafting our bylaws for Lisbeth MX. And uh, if anyone, that's a whole separate conversation around governance uh, practices for organizations, but uh, there's a lot of key tenants in there, uh, including things like this. Um, when, when there is a problem, when someone accuses your organization of racism, what do you do? And most organizations have no idea. They have diversity, inclusion, mission statements, and all that stuff. And I use the example of uh, a, a, a company, well, Futurepreneur, which many of you might know, and we wrote about it in Lisbeth, where they had an external stakeholder, an applicant who accused them of, of uh, racism. And uh, their response was to call that person and tell them that they weren't an applicant yet and therefore not part of their world, so fuck off. Pardon, oh, am I allowed to say that <laughs> on a seminar? Sorry, you can edit that out. That was not the right to say thing. <laughs> That was not the right thing to say to a woman of color who already experienced significant trauma because she was an exclusion because she was a woman of color in the entrepreneurship space. So what happened next? Then they tried to call her and convince her that they were really good people. Um, and uh, that, you know, that they, that they talked to the perpetrator uh, who was a volunteer and that he's a really good guy and everybody says he's a good guy. So must be your problem. Anyway, then that particular perpetrator uh, who had uh, basically posted racist comments uh, on, on Twitter at an event. And he, he, because of the conversation being called out on it, he doubled down and posted a 10,000 word essay on Medium about why black people bring it on themselves. Okay, after he was asked about this. So then um, now the organization didn't know about this. They didn't follow through, but other organizations did notice it. And in the end, that organization had to, pay, had to put up a big apology, oops, we messed up thing, and actually let that volunteer finally go. 
But uh, now when we look back at the, the whistleblower, she was traumatized all over again by the whole situation because everybody wanted to you know, question her and do this and do that. So it's a very good um, example of why we need to have better practices when we say we're all about diversity, inclusion and belonging. Uh, they did not anticipate uh, what, that, what that might mean and how to deal with it. So in our case, we have a process by which Members of that community are part of a are a part of a committee that will review the case. We will bring in a third party mediator if we need to 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 make sure we're not abusing our power and self interest in those conversations, etc. So, just one example of the why the how is important um, in a feminist business uh, environment. I'll also mention. Uh, okay, so going just bouncing around here a little bit. Um, we talk a lot about political uh, responsibility. And so a feminist business gets political. So when something like George Floyd happens, how many businesses actually posted something on their site as a statement of solidarity, especially when they have a big diversity inclusion mandate? Very few. And the argument usually is business and politics don't mix. Well, as, as you all know, in, in the environmental space, they certainly do mix and they mix a lot. <laughs> and so we have to think about what is our policy? How do we advance a social agenda uh, when something cataclysmic like that happens? And how, how do we as a business support those? And how many businesses did eventually kind of put Black Lives Matter statements all over the place, but it was lo a lot of businesses did not. And I'll just uh, mention one more example um, restorative justice. So when uh, something happens, uh, so here's another good example, the Green Party. Some of you remember the issue. Uh, if you're not in Canada, you may not, but uh, basically the Green Party hired the executive or hired a senior person from Engineers Without Borders who had a, re a record, a known record of um, sexual harassment. So the women in the Green Party complained. They were overlooked, including by Elizabeth May who said, it happened in the past, doesn't matter now. Well, what they underestimated the Green Party leadership is that they had deeply offended women who have perhaps experienced sexual harassment at work. Many resigned and left. Um, and in the end, the whole debacle resulted in him resigning six months after being hired. And I won't, there's lots of details out there about that. So what was the fail there? Where did the Green Party fail? Um, they again didn't have a process for thinking through what their tolerance level was for things like a, uh, you know, a person who had committed something after they hired him and they did not, apparently, I guess they didn't know, uh, after they hired him, something came to light. What would your organization do in that case? And do you have a zero tolerance policy or do you have a, a, a restorative justice approach to it, i.e. rehabilitation? And when does that kick in? Um, and when you've harmed someone through no, you know, through, through just being humans, we're going to make mistakes. How do you, uh, what is your approach and how do you mitigate that harm, including the people who may have blown the whistle and the communities that they represent? So um, I'm going to leave that there. There's a lot more. I have two more images to show you because I know we're running out of time and I want to leave time for questions. Um, so uh, one of the other ways we try to deal with things is talk about how power works in our organization. So this is how we represent Lim Lisbeth's MX power structure. The board of uh, the council, the governing board is at the bottom in service of everyone else. And normally the go board of governors are at the top. And we talk about you know, the different committees and the inputs and pollinators and all that kind of stuff. So the point is how, how do you communicate power and who makes decisions in your organization? And lastly, this is an ecosystem chart for Elizabeth. It's completely hard to read, but uh, this is what we use to kind of reference and say, who do we need to talk to when something big comes up? Who do we have to connect with? Because it's not just the people who work with us directly, it's our the people in the ecosystem who might have something be affected by the decisions that we make. Here are the governing values for Lisbeth. Um, I'm only going to um, point out a couple of them. 
and that is seventh generation principles. Many people here are familiar with ESG, probably environmental social governance um, metrics. The thing with those things and the thing with B Corp as arbiters of what good governance looks like in a corporation is they still own primarily count stuff that you can count. Uh, how many of this, how many of that. And uh, I would argue that a feminist organization uh, also looks at, uh, again, the, 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 the um, efficacy of the how. And that's a constant struggle. The how is the hard part. So um, 10 different feminist enterprise practices that we, ha that we have, social procurement policy. We make a point of saying that if we buy from you, you either have to be women led or women owned because we're a feminist organization. You don't have to do that, but that's what we do. Um, and we also, uh, we also then say though, if you are not women led or women owned, all we want you to do is sign on to the women, uh, women's, uh, women, the WEP principles at the UN, which is women's equality principles. And you don't have to do anything. You just sign up and say, we believe in women's equality. And then we would do business with you. I, I, well, I had an insurance company who refused to do it. Uh, so they walked away from the business and that's okay. That was our procurement requirements. I talked about, uh, we haven't talked about meeting practices, check-ins, uh, all those kinds of things, how we deal with conflict or harm. Big one on how we recruit. I'm gonna, uh, uh, whiteness is a problem in a lot of organizations. Too many white people and white culture dominating what professionalism means. Uh, including things like, you know, how to be professional, what to look respectable, how to, you know, what is, what are the norms around that? And they tend to be white culture led norms. Um, black women will tell you that they're often told to get their hair straightened uh, to look professional. So um, one of the things that uh, we try to do to make sure that we, we monitor our metrics in terms of uh, co contributors and also who we write about to make sure we hit our target of at least 30% uh, BIWOC uh, women that we either entrepreneurs that we write about or that we hire to write about people. We actively we write it down on every article and um, we recruit you know, people say, how do you find these folks? We just build really strong relationships with um, non-dominant communities before we need to invite people to come and work with us. So it's not enough to say, here's the job description or an opportunity. I hope some people of color apply. It's a better idea to already have a relationship with the you know, Black organization, Black Lives Matter in Toronto, for example. And then when something comes up, they will be open to promoting that on their network. Uh, we work well with Canadian women journal or Canadian journalists of color, for example, and uh, we don't have any trouble finding great writers uh, of color because we have those relationships. So you can't just go and throw it over the fence and ask. You have to build meaningful relationships with those communities and um, as another feminist uh, practice. Okay, so uh, to um, I've included a couple of slides because I know you're going to get the slides. This is a UK organization, Lawyers Against Poverty, and I really liked their feminist principles. They had a seminar. It's on YouTube. You can watch it. Uh, these are their feminist principles that they are suggesting every organization build into their how. And I also want to highlight West Coast Leaf, which has done a really great job of integrating feminist business principles into their uh, website, uh, what they do. And this particular paper, which talks about a feminist perspective on governance um, and how to center care in everything that you do, uh, to a couple of other comments. Um, so uh, that's basically it. And we have a few minutes left. And I apologize for if I feel like I, if I'm very unfeminist to download a lot of information on you. But it's a short session and I felt like maybe this would be the start of a conversation and not the end. So any thoughts or questions? I've got a question. Yes. At this moment in time, um, I run a business consultancy literally just with myself and my wife Maria, but we don't have a stated feminist policy and I, I made a note of lawyers against poverty. Do you have recommendations for any small businesses who don't have a stated policy? Obviously, you know, our practice is based on equality, but we don't have any, any stated policy. Where, where would we begin 
in terms of yeah. writing one or making a statement? Yeah, I really suggest that you write a, uh, so we talked about the four, the variety of movements, right? So I, I feel like as a small organization, it's, you're not just going to talk, you're not a feminist core, or you're an organization that wants to embrace what feminism can do to help you make a better business, right? Mm -hmm. So I feel like you need a, uh, and this is what I tell all my small businesses in the entrepreneurship space, is you need a code of conduct. And you can call it something else, but in that code of conduct, you can talk about your commitment. And that's, check out the West Leaf one, where they basically say, uh, they don't say we are feminists, but everything they say in there is inherently feminist and anti-oppression based, transparency. It shows that they're thinking about power and how to distribute it, uh, that and how they're going to relate to their stakeholders. Um, that kind of thing. So yes, as larger organizations, there's a lot more to unpack there, but I feel like a company of one or two can start with a code of conduct that reflects some of these um, goals and also then making sure your practices are articulated so that if anyone asks, well, how are you doing your social, like if you had a social procurement statement in your code of conduct, we are going to aim to procure 30%, which is kind of the running standard of our supplies from uh, BIWOC, I'm just gonna make this up, BIWOC led entrepreneurs or firms or companies. And 30% isn't that hard of a number to reach, even as a small business. What I found doing it myself is I just didn't have the community to know where to go. And once I did, all of a sudden I have this story about trying to find buttons for the apps. <laughs> and I wanted to work with a, uh, you know, a, a, um, a woman led, that was just a woman led firm and I had a hell of a time finding one and I'm like big in the fem I know the feminist space but I it, it took me a long time and extra effort and I realized that somehow my my networks weren't right um, and then it was a matter of figuring out how to engage with the network so that bang I could find that supplier right away can I Sometimes also just I jump in and yeah. say that in addition, what we've done, I mean, Lean for Flourishing is a very small organization too, <laughs> like we're like three people. But what we've also done, which has really been quite transformative, is we've adopted a set of design principles that we formed as an yeah. organization that like informs all of our work. So every piece of work, every consulting, you know, piece of work that we put out there, um, every program we design, um, we evaluate our work against the set of design principles and embedded in this design the design principles are all of you know feminist values as well as um you know a bunch of other values uh, they include things like human-centered design anti-oppression decolonized um mm -hmm. ecosystem approach um things like that and that's a, a way that we've really been able to practically implement um values the values of feminism into the work that we're doing like on a day-to-day -day basis yeah, I love what just Dean said, because that becomes your filter, right? Every decision you make, you refer back to those principles and you're telling your audience and your supporters and your stakeholders that, that those are the filters you're using. And I think that's the important, uh, that's the important part, especially for a very small enterprise. And I would also like to, you know, just add, if your ecosystem is too white, like when you map your ecosystem and you realize almost everyone you buy for is a male-led enterprise or a white-led enterprise, it's really time to, it shouldn't be that hard for us to actually redistribute our indirect, you know, spends, uh, ec economic work on organize a broader range of potential uh, suppliers. And that's a simple one, for example, for most businesses to be able to execute, even if you're buying pens and paper and all of those things. And you might, some people say, I'm always looking for the lowest price. That may be the case, but you know what? I found the lowest price in other communities too. Um, doesn't always have to be the, it's like, you know, shopping on Amazon. Do you really have to default to Amazon every time you buy a book or can you actually go to the indie your the indie platform if you're in the states or buy direct from the publisher if you're here how hard is that if, if what you want to do is achieve a better business and a better society 
Um, Petra, just bef uh, I want to thank you for your presentation today, and I just wanted to put a shout out for the Feminist Enterprise Commons, uh, which I've been a, a, a somewhat active member in. I wouldn't say very active, but somewhat active member in. And I just want to recommend it to everybody because it's really a place where these conversations are going on every day, um, and not just you know once in a once when we have uh, Petra here. Um, so I would really recommend uh, folks join it. It's a great place to get support. Um, it's a great place to share. So, uh, and it's a, a, a welcoming space as well. So uh, check it out, Feminist Ooh. Enterprise Commons. Yeah. And uh, if, if you, I, I think Petra, you have some enticements to, for people who are gonna come for the first time or something, but I'll, I'll leave you to say whatever yeah, it is you yeah, wanna yeah. say about we'd, it. We'd love to see you there uh, and happy to give you a, a free, I'll, I'll send it to Anthony so you can get free access for like three months and kind of join us. I have to warn you, it's a women centric space. So we, uh, you know, we tend to center women's experiences, but men are, are welcome. And uh, as Anthony has experienced, uh, but you know, women's spaces are so few and far between. We want to make sure that, um, you know, it was designed to center women's experiences, not sort of general experiences. But it would definitely uh, be great to have have you as part of the conversation as. Uh, you know, a partner in the struggle to figure this out. And I also wanted to say, don't try to be perfect at first. The important thing is that you're trying, you will stumble, someone's going to call you out and, uh, and then you, you will figure it out. We learn this best in community with, with others. Yeah, and I put Lisbeth on there to our about page. Uh, we're in the process of changing the website. So uh, we have the governance page, the um, procurement policy is there. One thing I am working on right now uh, is a digital, a feminist digital policy. So uh, I could share this with you all if you'd like. We basically took an inventory of all the tech, our tech stack at Lisbeth, which is like, I don't know, 27 apps. I don't know if you all feel that way as entrepreneurs. It's like, oh my God, I didn't realize I was using so many things. And then we took a look at how many women on what their board looked like, you know, in terms of uh, gender equality and diversity. And, and we also uh, assess them for any, any news articles for harassment or racism or all those things to see if, how they were behaving in, in the world. And uh, so I have this big long chart. And uh, what we wanted to do with that is say uh, in our procurement practices, you know, we can't dump uh, Google, <laughs> you know, um, even though their practices are somewhat offensive on many levels. Uh, but we say we're aware of Google's practices, we understand it, and we are trying to work in some way to, um, you know, try to mitigate some of the harms that Google does by doing X. And again, we can't, we're not going to be perfect, we're going to miss stuff. But we do feel as a feminist organization, and increasingly in the world of corporate governance, digital privacy, and privacy policies, and, and your own, uh, you know, choice of tech stack, sometimes there are alternatives to bad actors and not researching them just because they're the main ones is um, something you might wanna think about and address if you, if you, and then if you make the decision and no, we can't move from that right now because this is a, but at least you've made the effort to kind of be aware of what the practices of the company you, you're buying from actually is. Amazing, thank you. <clears throat> So uh, PK, Petra, thank you so much for um, the, all the work that you've done in this space. And we're going to be posting all of your information, the videos and the notes from the meeting. And uh, everyone who attended will be uh, add, uh, added onto the um, wiki page. Uh, just a reminder that the next meeting is April 13th, and that's going to be Simon and Igor. We actually, we actually have all of our meetings booked all the way out into um, July. So uh, May 11th is going to be Desiree uh, Dreisner. I don't have any full information on her uh, presentation yet. June 3rd will be C.V. Harkwell, which um, Petra was no, no, uh, mentioning. And um, June 13th is our 100, or July 13th is our 100th meeting. So Anthony is going to be doing a bit of a retrospective. And that means that... Um, um, the next meeting after that, there's going to be two months off. So August and September, we'd be off because the R3.0 conference is in September. So that means our October meeting will be a 101 meeting, which I believe will be some announcements about some amazing things that are sort of been happening and percolating in the background with the Flourishing Enterprise Institute and the Strongest Female Business Model Group. 
So with that said, uh, really appreciate um, the fact that everyone came today and uh, we'll look forward to seeing you at the next meeting. Okay, happy Thanks. International Women's Week. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Bye. 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 Bye.